You're about to hear episode four of the Magical Mystery Talk, and after we'd recorded this one, Matt and Desiree decided that they had a whole load more information to drop than we got round to in this episode. So for anyone wanting to take a deeper dive into all this, and if two hours leaves you craving even more information on what we're talking about today, there's going to be a bonus episode, a part two, available on the usual platforms for anyone who wants to absorb all of that. So do watch out for the bonus episode available in due course. And that being said, let's get into episode four proper. Episode 4 of the Magical Mystery Talk, and this is another anniversary episode. It's kind of a sombre occasion, but that's rather fitting for 2020, isn't it? Because we're just about on the 40th anniversary of the assassination of John Lennon, December the 8th, 1980, in the US date format, and it was the morning of December the 9th, 1980, in UK format, tying into the nines once again, as we got into in the last show. So, 40 years on, boy, I've got vivid memories myself of hearing that news. My dad was very upset about it because he was a John Lennon fan. I can remember the radio uh, news bulletins just being full of this story, and I can remember the charts in 1980 as well. Uh, John Lennon's Just Like Starting Over, which had just been released off of Double Fantasy, shot to the number one spot. And everyone thought it was going to be Christmas number one that year, but it wasn't because it was beaten by the St. Winifred School Choir with There's No One Quite Like Grandma, which has got to be one of the biggest <laughs> musical travesties ever. And then after Christmas, there were two more Lennon songs. Imagine got to number one. That was nine years old by that point. And then Woman, another track from Double Fantasy. But he missed out on the Christmas number one 1980, which is tragic. But anyway, Matt and Desiree are here with me and... They've been doing a lot of swatting up on this most momentous of events, and we've got a whole lot to get through today. So welcome back, guys. Hello. Hello. There's no one quite like Grandma. Oh. <laughs> and you know, this will probably mean very little to nothing to any American listeners who hopefully never, never heard that song heard before. That song no, before. Just, just, yeah, for, for the benefit of, yeah, type for the benefit of the US guys, type in St. Winifred School Choir and just take a look. Oh, that, and, and you'll see what beat Lennon to number one in December 80. What? Oh, wow. <laughs> it's like Joe Dolce, shut up your face, keeping Ultravox Vienna off number one famously as yeah. well, isn't it? And I bought both of those. Oh, my days. Well, uh, where do we start with this one? Uh, we're trying to keep some loose framework to this whole thing, but I know from the notes that we've exchanged between us that this one shoots off all over the place and uh, darts off in so many different directions. So we're in for a roller coaster ride here. Uh, we did think that we might try and start by looking at Mark David Chapman, who is said to be Lennon's assassin. And we should probably delve into some of his character, I guess, before we get onto the day itself. So where should we start here? Well, I would like to say before we start, if I may, that um, I'm thoroughly disappointed that I missed your guys' last podcast on John Lennon's um, anniversary of his birth. And um, But you guys did an awesome job, and I'm, I, I was really impressed with your work on that. And... Um, you guys kept it very respectful and nice and wonderful, and I appreciate that. But I have a feeling that this topic in particular is not going to go over so well with a lot of listeners. <laughs> I know that I did a, um, a pretty well-organized um, effort uh, on one of my articles, and I got quite a bit of hate mail from that. So this topic is not, in my opinion at least, not very well discussed because I, I feel like a lot of people take this um, event of John Lennon's murder and kind of stick their fingers in their ears and la 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 their way out of it because they don't want to they don't want to question it they don't want to 
know much more about it, but there is a lot of discrepancies and just weird coincidences and just weird things that um, have gone on with this investigation. It actually wasn't even an investigation. It was like case closed. They didn't even investigate it. So I wanted to say, first of all, thank you to you guys for um, doing such a lovely show for his birthday. And I think that this topic is just as equally, um, if not more so, uh, important. Um, but it might not be quite as respectful as you guys did. <laughs> so oh, well, I just want to start out by saying that. <laughs> it's a real button pusher, this subject, isn't it, for people? It really is. People get very offended. And, you know, I mean, it's it's a, a sad story. It's a tragic ending to um you know john lennon's life there and um it seems to me people just don't want to hear it so sure and i hopefully... don't understand why people are so offended i mean beatles fans i mean i haven't come across this myself personally but i know other beat i know you desiree have come across as you say you've mentioned yourself you've come across this animosity uh, right. through your website through articles and i know other uh, beatles fans that are kind of podcasters and but they're not in the alternative quote unquote um avenues of things but within the mainstream and, and they bring up the subject of mark david chapman and mind control and cia and they themselves have said that they get a lot of hate mail back and a right. lot of bad vibes from beatles fans and i just don't understand why i mean surely you're not desecrating the memory of John Lennon by suggesting that Mark David Chapman might have been uh, an Intel services driven assassin. Right. I, I can't see why that's offensive to a Beatles fan, because, as I say, you're not you're not desecrating the memory of John Lennon at all. You're not. What, you're what not. I really no. what I truly think is the whole deal with that is that right away once um, Mark David Chapman was arrested and, you know, the news broke and all of that. Um, you know, they went right in to say that he, the only reason he did this was his claim to fame. Like, that's the only reason why he um, decided to shoot John Lennon was he wanted to become famous himself. So right there, all of those Beatles fans were like, okay, we, you know, never mention his name, pretend it doesn't exist because we don't want to make him famous for this, right? His whole um, intention behind the murder, supposedly. So I think that just just with that um, announcement that, that that was his only goal in all of this, it made everybody kind of like, okay, well, it never happened. It, he didn't exist. So we'll never speak of him again. And so it kind of cut that you know inquiry by the masses as to what exactly happened right then and there because the Beatles fans didn't want to even acknowledge his name, let alone anything that he did or what he was about or you know any of that. So... It's such a pointless reason for it, though, just putting it down to him being a lone nut that wanted to be famous. You know, it's, it's an outrageous reason for somebody to be taken out. Whereas if you accept that Chapman showed all the signs of being an MK Ultra mind control assassin, at least it puts some reason for Lennon right. being taken out. It makes more sense of why he was than the completely senseless story that it was just a deranged fan. Right. Or even that he was just crazy and, you know, schizophrenic, which there has been some questions, but he was tried. He pled guilty and was, you know, um, deemed capable of standing trial for his own on his own account and not and not insane. So that, well, he, that he obviously was, uh, he, he was uh, um, uh, examined by nine psychiatrists, if I'm not mistaken, before mm -hmm. he stood in court for his preliminary hearing. And all nine psychiatrists, if I'm not mistaken, all of them said he was fit to stand trial. They found no signs of, you know, any psychosis. Right. They diagnosed him with like personality disorders, but nothing, you know, not schizophrenia, not anything that wouldn't let him stand, you know, be fit for standing trial. Yeah. So, yeah. And then he was, he just pled guilty. So there was no investigation. There was no real trial. He pled guilty and then sent in, given his sentence and then that was it. Yeah. So, you know, nobody got to hear any testimony. No, there wasn't any testimony. There wasn't any witness accounts. You know, there wasn't anything like that because it was just, it was a closed case. 
That was and it. Of course, they got and their of person. Course, this, this flies in the face of the the constant uh, narrative that we always get whenever Mark David Chapman has been spoken about, whether it's in a news bulletin or in an article or whatever. Since since 1982, now whenever his name is mentioned in a news report or whatever, it always comes with the added narrative: crazed low nut who was seeking to be famous. Right. Um, and has some people have argued, and I think quite convincingly, it's a good case to put forward. If he wanted to seek fame, if that was his motive bef- behind wanting to kill Lennon, then surely he would have pled not guilty, which would have then given him the biggest stage possible, i.e., as some people have dubbed it would have been, the trial of the century. He right. killed one of the most famous men of the 20th century, the most f- one of the most famous men ever in entertainment. And he decided to plead guilty, which then denied him the chance to be able to get onto the to get on the TV. I mean, can you imagine if there'd have been a trial? It would have been 24 hour TV. It would have been hey. constant press reports. Uh, been bigger mag- than OJ. Would have been bigger. It would have been much bigger than OJ. Right. So and he passed that down. He didn't take that chance. He did, or he didn't take that opportunity. Mm. So you know, if he was seeking fame, then well, <laughs> well, he 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 blew it. Then you know, um, there are some parallels here with Sirhan Sirhan, aren't there? That uh, you were drawing attention to in the chat thread, the alleged assassin of Bobby Kennedy. Yeah. Oh. Um, yeah, I mean, one of the uh, the psychiatrists, one of the nine psychiatrists that um, um, examined him was um, I can't remember the name's man's name. I think it was Bernard Diamond. Is it Bernard Diamond? His name Bernard, was. Yeah, Doctor Bernard Diamond. Yeah. Yeah, he was one of the doctors. Um, correct me if I'm wrong. Who was actually um, involved in the Sirhan Sirhan case? Um, so he was one of the doctors if you want to look at suspicious or little uh, little signposts or little red flags that's that, that's a potential red flag that one of the nine psychiatrists that uh, uh, um, examined mark david chapman uh, before this this hearing where he decided to plead uh, guilty um yeah one of those nine doctors was uh, bernard diamond and okay. yeah and if you look at if you look at sahan sahan you've got it's, it's pretty much a kind of similar mo to to mark david chapman isn't it mm. right. um yeah, so and he that's... claims he can't remember a thing about what happened all these years later. Yeah, the the woman in the polka dot dress, isn't it? Or yeah. with yeah. Sirhan Sirhan. And then you've got yeah. John, you've got John Hinckley Jr., who was the would be oh, assassin goodness, of, yeah. of of Ronald Reagan. And, right. Uh, so th- there's some connections there to Chapman as well, or some overlap. Yeah, that that one's actually pretty interesting. So um, when um, Chapman was arrested, he had said that the, he actually had like a hit list of several other people. So if John Lennon didn't work out, um, he was going to go down the list. And um, one of those people that was on his list was Ronald Reagan, which is interesting because only a couple of months later, Ronald Reagan was um, shot and um, by uh, John Hinckley Jr. there. And um, it's also said that John Hinckley Jr. also had a copy of The Catcher in the Rye with his, in his possession at the time, which obviously... Sure. Mark, J- Mark David Chapman also had yeah. an obsession with this catcher of the rye. So, it's, and it's a, uh, yeah, interesting cool. to note there too is um, John Hinckley Jr. and uh, Mark David Chapman were both born in 1955, only like 19 days away from each other. So they were pretty much almost exactly the same age and both born in Texas, um, Fort Worth, Texas for, uh, for Mark David Chapman there which is George Bush country. I don't know if we want to get into that. <laughs> but, but yeah, uh, just some interesting correlations between the two um, assassins there. Sure. I, I mean, I can't remember when, when the, uh, the attempted assassination on Reagan. It was early to, very early to mid-1981. So it was only yeah. a few months after right. the Lennon uh, incident. Yeah. Um, right. And, and, of course... John Hinckley, um, the, 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 another thing that was uh, was widely connected to the John Hinckley uh, assassination attempt was uh, John Hinckley's uh, apparent um, obsession with the actress, the movie actress, Jodie Foster. Right. Um, and that was a, a leading factor 
um, as the mainstream media said at the time, you know, uh, uh, reported at the time, it was a leading factor in his desire to shoot uh, President Reagan. But what's not so widely uh, reported um, is that he also, Hinckley also had a bit of an obsession with John Lennon. Um, for example, um, if, if my research isn't misleading me, apparently during his trial, during Hinckley's trial uh, for the assassination attempt, the court was told uh, that in February 1981, he'd actually stood outside the Dakota building um, on the spot where John Lennon had been shot and he had a gun in his pocket and, and he wanted to, and I quote, quote unquote, he wanted to destroy himself. Um, I've actually got the report here. I've, I've, I've taken a photocopy of it. I've got it on paper here. And according to mainstream news reports, uh, in May 1981, shortly after the attempt on Reagan's life. So, yeah, it was mid 1981. Uh, law officials had revealed after interviews with Hinckley that he was, and I quote, obsessed with the death of John Lennon and in his mind binded together the slain Beatles star and Jodie Foster. He was quoted as saying, my life is screwed up. The world is even more screwed up. I don't know why people want to live. John Lennon is dead. I still think Jody. Uh, I still think about Jody uh, all the time. That's all I think about, really. That and John Lennon's death. They were sort of binded together. They were sort of binded together before December the eighth. They've been uh, binded together since last summer, really. Uh, John and Jody uh, have been binded together with me, and now one of them's dead and uh, yeah when they investigated uh, Hinckley's hotel room uh, they reportedly found uh, a number of books and one of those books was about John Lennon and yeah the other one was uh, of course uh, The Catcher in the Rye um, which is uh, the, the, the so-called um, as researchers have, have pointed out it was possibly the trigger book uh, for Mark David Chapman as well it was the book that uh, was found when, when the police arrived at the Dakota after Lennon had been shot and, and Mark David Chapman standing there. That's what he's reading. And of course, he later said, uh, and he still says, I think, if I'm not mistaken, he does keep saying that um, uh, this book was, he, he wanted to become the character in the book, Holden mm -hmm. Caulfield, right. um, who saw everybody as a phony, that this is a book. It's, it's not a disturbing book. I mean, you'd think it's, it, if you hadn't read it, it's not, a, it's, it would be, a disturbing book seeing as it seems to be a trigger for all these you know assassins or would-be assassins but if you actually read the book it's basically a story about a 15 16 year old um upper middle class maybe maybe higher than that student who's at boarding school in america uh and he just sees everybody as phonies as superficial um right. like for example he'll go and watch a movie in a in a cinema in a movie theater and he'll watch the actor uh, performing in the movie and he'll say to himself yeah he's a good movie actor but he's a bit of a phony because he knows he's a good actor and it's coming through in his performance and he's trying to cover it he's a bit superficial that's that's the running theme in the book that that Holden Caulfield this 15 16 year old uh sees everybody as a phony so this is what you know this is the theme that Mark David Chapman had which we're told well according to mainstream reports we're told that uh, uh, Mark David Chapman um, per perceived John Lennon to be this phony. Um, you know, John Lennon had been, to, to his eyes, um, whether this is true or not, or whether he's been mind controlled to think this, or whether this is just the mainstream media pushing this narrative. I mean, he said it himself in a the few interviews he's been in, um, that he, Mark David Chapman, perceived John Lennon to be a phony basically because he'd always been, you know, since the late 60s, early 70s, especially, he'd been held up to be this peace campaigner who was out to 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 campaign for the downtrodden man, you know, against the establishment. And then towards 1980 and in 1980, we're told that Mark David Chapman started to read books and magazine articles about Lennon and discovered actually that John Lennon was a very wealthy man. Uh, he had lots of properties. He was living in this palatial apartment at the Dakota. And it was at that point that Mark David Chapman said to himself, this guy is a phony. He's not this peacenik. Champagne uh, socialist. He's a champagne socialist. He's a phony. It's all an act. And at the same time, he started to read uh, The Catcher in the Rye as well with this phony kind of theme running around it. So that's what made him go and kill Lennon. 
um, I think one of the statements he made, and it might have been in court, actually, he said, I wanted to push the message of Holden Caulfield and The Catcher in the Rye, this book. I wanted to make it a world-known subject, a well, a world-known book, and by and to do that, I killed John Lennon in order to make that happen. That's what he said. That's one of the many things that he said. But yeah, back to Hinckley. Um, he he's kind of linked in with this book. So you were right about weird... the date, by the way, Matt. It was thirtieth of March. I just looked it up in eighty one. It was the thirtieth of March. And I, I've just got uh, some photos of John Hinckley, and he looks disturbingly like Mark David Chapman. There's a definite indeed, resemblance there. Indeed, a yes, actually, yeah. So would it be? Would I be reaching it if I was to say that both these men were? fostered maybe even from birth if not from early childhood to become what they became and that either one of them could have switched it could have been mark david chapman that could have been picked to shoot uh reagan and it could have been um hinkley to shoot lennon i mean sure. judging sure. by what you say desiree about the reagan thing and mark david chapman and also Hinckley and him standing outside the Dakota and having books about Lennon in his room and the catcher right. in the rye, it could very possibly have been the case. It could have been like a like a backup plan, you know, if if Chapman yeah. failed, then the other one would have been in place and vice versa, or or, or who knows how these people think <laughs> or do. <laughs> so yeah. Lennon was removed just before Reagan took up his presidency, which is interesting. It was the last days right. of Jimmy Carter, I guess. Correct. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. He, so he, December, so Reagan would have just been elected. So he would have been the president elect and then um, going into office officially January 81. Right. So, and, and this would be the reason, this is one of the reasons that uh, a number of researchers um, would say that this is the, one of the reasons that if there was, if it was an Intel assassination, this is one of the reasons why they would have wanted Lennon taken out because um, the, the Reagan administration, or perhaps maybe not even Reagan himself, maybe his vice president, George H.W. Bush, an ex CIA head, uh, he was right. the head of the CIA in 1976. Um, they would have perceived it, uh, Lennon to have been a threat. Um, I mean, there are cynics who say, who have, I mean, you know, you, you read these sort of chat forums and stuff where this kind of subject is is uh, uh, debated and, and chatted about. And, and the cynics will say that the cynics that are against this argument, this intel assassination argument, will say, well, <laughs> you know, yeah, but Lennon, you know, he he, he wasn't a threat. You know, he, he, he was just a pop singer. He was just a pop right. star. Right. But he was the biggest star in the world. He wasn't just a pop singer. He, he and the Beatles together had changed culture. Right. Uh, they weren't just musicians. I mean, it, you know, it, back in the late 60s, when, when he recorded Give Peace a Chance, um, it became the anthem for the for the anti Vietnam War movement, I think it was su it was sung outside a protest. I can't remember what year it was, but it was sung outside the White House by thousands of people. Right, they didn't, he they didn't sing "We Shall Overcome" or any other of the older anthems. They sang "Give Peace a Chance," and that just kind of indicates the kind of uh, uh, power that John Lennon had. Right, um, lots of influence under over the younger crowd. Right. Yes. You know, the younger generation. And that's the ones that they seemingly at least were afraid of because they had a huge movement going that could have easily taken out, you know, the older mindset and the, the Vietnam War. They're being drafted like left and right. And, you know, people were very unhappy. And so that younger generation had a huge voice. And it, it was almost like John Lennon was, was in a, a lot of ways leading that that movement. People he were was looking one of up the few, him. wasn't he? Right. I mean, he was, he was one of the few well-known stars that was actually really doing it. Other artists were singing songs about it, but Lennon was actually getting engaged. And this worried Nixon at the time. Again, if you want to argue against a cynic who said, oh, he was just a pop star, we well, could say, well, yeah, he was a pop star, but he was actually doing something about it. And if you look what was going on in the early 70s, especially when he came to America, uh, and began get he really I mean before he came to America he was in Britain he was doing the bed-ins it was very much it was he was campaigning but it was more of an ideological thing it was more uh, uh, talking about it and writing songs about it but whereas when he came to the US he got engaged with a lot of the so-called quote-unquote radical uh, 
protesters, the radical movement, such mm -hmm. as the Black Panthers, um, and and so on and so on, and and uh, the Women's Lib movement, and and so many others. And I know we we spoke about this, Mark. Um, before we, we we chatted about this on the Lennon, trying to work out how sincere he may have been, if this was you know coming from the heart or if he was put up to it as some kind of agenda, we were really trying to make sense of all that on that show because we just concluded that he was such an enigma, such a su such a difficult character to understand. But one of the things also that well, that came out, um, and, and this was in the press at the time, uh, back in the early seventies, John Lennon was was posing the idea and kind of announcing to to the public that what he wanted to do and this was in 1971 72 when was the last when was the election was it 72 when nixon was coming up for re-election i think it was 72 or yeah 72. 72 it would have been yeah yeah um around that time I, I might be wrong but from what i i remember from what i can recall from reading various books and stuff i think that the age of the age of, of voting was going to be lowered. So a lot, there was going to be a younger demographic that was uh, allowed to vote, which meant that, the, you know, in terms of uh, uh, the counterculture, the so-called counterculture, people that were into rock music and, and, and fans of John Lennon, would have, there would have been more, you know, in terms of votes, if you wanted to sway the vote, John Lennon would have had, uh, basically, President Nixon was worried. Okay, what what was going on was John Lennon was putting it out um, that he was planning to do, in in conjunction with these upcoming elections, what he was planning to do was to take out a U.S. wide concert tour, either an all star concert tour with him being the headline, I guess, or if he couldn't get the all stars to take place, if he couldn't get these various musicians to take part, he would then do it himself and take this concert tour around the U.S in order to, and then it's, this is in his words, to radicalize the audience, to get them to engage, to get them to look at radical politics, quote unquote, radical politics. Mm -hmm. So we're talking anti-Vietnam movement, we're talking Black Panthers, we're talking women's lib, we're talking even Irish, um, the IRA, we're talking, you know, really, really radical anti-establishment kind of issues. Mm -hmm. And um, one of his ideas, and again, he posed this, one of his ideas was to go around the the US with this concert tour thing and in the, in the foyer of the auditoriums and the theatres to, to him he wanted people to turn up say like the Black Panthers and so on and so on various radical groups to turn up from these local you know local radical groups from wherever the concert was going to turn up and basically hand out leaflets and this worried President Nixon this is what got the FBI to finally you know, to, the, the FBI to to actually monitor John Lennon and and to try and throw him out of the US because President Nixon, and this is according to people that were there at the time that have since said this, President Nixon was absolutely shit scared because with the lowering of the voting, this opened up the voting to people who would have been into John Lennon, into the right. Beatles, into the anti-Vietnam, anti-President Nixon kind of... I, I was just going to add in there, and um, who was uh, the head of the CIA at that time? That, that would have been H.W. Bush. Bush. That's right. Yeah, that right. was in 1976. So he was... Yeah, I think that right. was a little very, later. very yeah. much. So if you think about the timing of this, by 1980, Lennon really wasn't much of a threat anymore because he'd taken five years off to, to well, become no, because... a house husband to raise Sean. He just put out Double Fantasy, but it wasn't full of radical revolutionary tracks. It was just full of nice songs. And Nixon was long gone by 1980. So Lennon was nowhere near as much of a threat then as he had been well, earlier in the 70s. So you'd think really. if they'd wanted to take him out, the time to do it would have been back in the 70s, which does make me wonder how connected it was to the Reagan-Bush administration incoming in that they left it until 1980. Well, the thing is, what happened was with that tour, it was that tour that got Nixon really, really scared. Um, and what he did was that's when the deportation proceedings against John Lennon started. They tried to deport John Lennon and they used the excuse. And it was a flimsy excuse because it wasn't standing up because John Lennon fought this in court. And, and won in the end. He won, he won in 1975, but uh, he, he kept fighting it and it was a flimsy case. Basically, there were the, the, the US deportation, uh, the immigration uh, uh, service of, of the US was using this flimsy excuse that John Lennon had been busted for drugs in England in 1968 or 69, whenever it was, for a bit of dope. 
Uh, they were using that as the basis to throw him out of the US because John Lennon wanted to stay in the US uh, and he wanted a visa, but they were threatening to take his visa away and throw him out. Um, and it soon transpired that it wasn't that, that, that the reason they actually wanted him to get out was because he was getting involved in all this this radical politics. Um, so he got a lawyer involved, a guy by the name of Leon Wilds. And what Leon Wilds said to John Lennon was, and by this point, the FBI started to bug John Lennon. They were following him. They were wiretapping him. They were doing everything they possibly could to throw him out. And they were just looking for something to happen, like a drug, like maybe, you know, he, he takes uh, some drugs and they can sort of plant him with some kind of like false drug bust or whatever. So what Leon Wilds said to him was, his, his lawyer, he the, the guy who got got involved to try and keep him in the US. He said to him, look, John, if you want to stay here, what you've got to do is you have to stop messing around and hanging around with these radical politicians, right? Stop it. Just stop stop it all. Just, just, just put it to the back and forget about it, okay? No more speeches to the media about the Black Panthers or Nixon or Vietnam or whatever and stop hanging around with these people. So that's why he stopped. So if you check, if you look, 1972, you notice from 1972, well, maybe 1973 to 1980, as, as you say, Mark, if you if you notice, there's virtually nothing that John Lennon talks about that's political. It's it's back to the music. It's back to recording. It's back to being a regular, you know, singer, songwriter, that's what right. have you. That's right. Now, what happened was. Um, yeah, it, look, on the face of it. Yeah, Mark, it does look like in 1980 that he was he'd recorded double fantasy and the songs are all about you know uh, being a dad being a father being a husband and living this kind of quiet life away from the music business which he had which he had been doing for five years because after he got his green card in 1975 he just stopped making music and and kind of backed out but um as yoko ono has since attested on the week he was shot he'd been scheduled to participate in a street demonstration. Uh, and this was in San Francisco, and this was uh, uh, over workers' rights. Uh, so this was his first activity of this type since the early 1970s. And there's also rumors, and I haven't been able to confirm this, but there's also rumors that he was planning to participate uh, in anti-nuclear demonstrations and protests as well. And I, I really, I mean, I, I've read that 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 particular claim a, a few in a few places but i haven't been able to confirm it and that's a bit of a shame but that that's that's huge now what i also didn't know until quite recently is he got his green card in 1975 his u.s resident alien card in other words but in 1981 had he survived then he would have been eligible to take it to the next step which would have been full u.s citizenship so can you imagine he really forgot the full U.S. citizenship, and then he'd started doing these anti-nuclear uh, demonstrations and all these marches that he was planning. There would be, there would have been no way that there would have, that the, the Reagan and Bush would have not have been able to throw him out of the country. That would have been it. Mm. So he was right. taken out before that happened. And he would have had surveillance mm. all over him, so they would have known that that was in his plans. Yeah, exactly. We should probably circle back round to Chapman then. And uh, directly before this event, he'd been doing a lot of traveling around the world, ostensibly as part of this charity. Was it World Vision? Is that what it was called? Yeah. So uh, World Vision. And he was also part of the YMCA as well. Um, it, it It's all a little fuzzy. I don't know if mm. Matt has um, kind of honed in on that a little bit more or not. Yeah, but um, you're right. It's fuzzy, it's, isn't it? It's yeah. very, it's it's very fuzzy. The, the whole, honestly, the, this whole entire subject really is. <laughs> he he travelled <laughs> but... <laughs> widely, but money never seemed to be a problem. Right. So it, it's not just like he, you know, visited the normal places, Paris and and London, and you know those kind of. He literally went. Um, I have a list here. He went to Tokyo, Hong Kong, Singapore, Bangkok, Delhi, Beirut. Uh, Geneva, London, Paris, Dublin, I mean, everywhere within a three-week period, or maybe it was six-week period, but, you know, like, boom, 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 all right after another, literally went and took a tour around the world, and um, and there's, there's no, he was like a vagabond, he didn't have money, I don't know who... Um, how he afforded to do these things, but apparently they were with World Vision, 
Um, but World Vision isn't in all of those places either. It, it's very strange. World so Vision is CIA front, do we think? <laughs> That's um, what it yeah, kind of seems like. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, the, the thing with the YMCA is, um, uh, um, and and World Vision, because YMCA and the World Vision thing seem to be hand in hand. Um, wow, yeah. Um, what happened was, uh, Mark David, I think, I don't know where to start, you know that. Yeah. It's, it's, it's absolutely huge. Um, the thing with the, with the World Trip, it's really weird because he was working as a junior employee at the time um, at a, a mental institution. Um, or a hospital he'd been <laughs> what happened was this was about 1977 I think it was he was going through a bit of um, a bit of a, a crisis a, 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 a kind of an emotional crisis and he wanted to kill himself um, programming and... wearing off sorry sorry he, yeah, well, I think exactly. he attempted to. He attempted to kill himself. He attempted himself. to, yeah. Mm -hmm. he, he, he called a, a suicide hotline and they put him in touch with a psychiatric social worker. And this was when he was living in Hawaii because he kept, he kept, he'd hold a job and then he'd lose his job and then he'd get another job and he'd lose the job. So this was in between that kind of, you know, that kind of uh, thing where he had a job and he, and he decided to, to get another job and he was in Hawaii by this point. This is, it's really odd. I don't know where to start. I, I really don't. I, I, I'll, 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 I'll forget that for the minute, okay? Forget that for the minute. Let's start with the YMCA because this takes us right back to the beginning of his life. Mm -hmm. uh, he joined the YMCA um, when he was uh, still kind of like in his early teens, I think. Right. Um, and in that Georgia. Was, yeah, in Georgia. And that was mm -hmm. through his father, apparently, who, who introduced him to the YMCA. And interestingly, his father, I think we should point out, um was uh, a when 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 uh, mark was born he was uh, a, a sergeant in the u.s air force mm -hmm. so uh, in fort worth uh in in texas so so military okay so i just thought i'd mention that just if a it, coincidence it, nothing to worry yeah, about. yeah exactly so mm -hmm. so we've got nothing military dad here. yeah exactly so military dad introduces um mark chapman to the ymca um and what what was going on was Mark wanted to, he was a counselor there. He had a, a job in the summer camp and he would do this every year. It was like a, a, a something he would do every year at the YMCA. He would, he would be a, a counselor for the summer camp for kids. Uh, and apparently he was really good at this. Uh, the kids loved him. Um, so he, this was his kids job. nicknamed him Nemo, by the way. Yeah. His I kids, don't... yeah, the kids nicknamed him Nemo because he was so, because they loved him. He was like a Pied Piper. They absolutely yeah. loved him. Um, but what he wanted to do, he's, that was kind of like a part-time kind of job. And he wanted to get a full-time job with the YMCA. So, and the only way he could do that was to get a university uh, degree. And he didn't have anything near that. So he had to re-enlist in college. Uh, he had to go to college. This is a few years later. So I say he, he joined the YMCA as a, a child. But when he left school, uh, he became a camp counsellor and yeah, he had to go back to school basically to to get the qualifications that he needed uh, mm -hmm. to, to become this, to get a full time job. And um, while he was at the YMCA, he um, yeah, he got he, he there was a there was a program um, that was that was going on at the time. And I think it's still going uh, going now. Uh, it's a program. It's a YMCA program and it's called ICCP abroad. Uh, it's an international camp counselor program, which quote unquote works side by side with other local young men of a host country as counselors in a camp or camp like setting. So it's an international thing. The YMCA basically is a, a worldwide youth organization. It's Christian heavy. Um, and Mark David Chapman is said to have been uh, a, a very dedicated Christian. Uh, young Christian. It's a. It's um, and it stands for Young Men's Christian Association. It's one of those non-governmental organisations, an NGO. Um, it's got, it's got bases and 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 links to about 120 countries across the world, and it has youth hostels where members of the YMCA can stay, and it does quote unquote humanitarian works around the world. So this is what um, this is what Mark David Chapman was getting involved with with regards to this this ICCP abroad uh, initiative uh, in conjunction with the YMCA. Um, it's, 
and he could have picked any country in the world okay and this was in uh, 1975 so he was 20 years old he could have picked any country in the world to go to okay to do this he could have gone somewhere nice and hot and warm and sunny and beautiful and lovely and and where does he pick he picks beirut the <laughs> capital of lebanon which at that time was going through some bloody um battles yes um it's a real you know, CIA stronghold, though, Beirut. Ex well, exactly. This is the thing. Why, why would he choose uh, uh, Beirut? It's like, it's like a couple of researchers I've looked at have said, look, Mark David Chapman was uh, a born-again Christian, okay? He was a young born-again Christian. Um, so why didn't he choose the Holy Land? If he wanted to go to the Middle East, why didn't he go to the Holy Land and go to Jerusalem or Bethlehem or Nazareth? Why did he choose this this very volatile and violent part of the world to go and 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 take part in this this program with the ymca yeah mark as you say cia um there's a former case officer uh, for the cia um who's who's uh, given who's made links between ymca and the cia um i hope i get his name right his name is philip ag uh, a g double e uh, he's a former case officer for the cia he was between 1957 to 68 and he's a whistleblower basically and he wrote a book titled inside the company uh, cia diary in which he notes you know his own personal experiences whilst working for the agency mm. and he claims that the ymca was of use to the cia because it was in his words and i'm paraphrasing uh, here it was in his words an advantageous venue in which to widen the agency's range of contacts and potential agents through it and there's another source i've come across uh, an author by the name of bob woodward he's a veteran u.s investigative journalist for the washington post he's the water and in guy, his book it? yeah yes you're right actually yeah i didn't realize until you said yeah that's right yeah one of the one of the investigators of that um and in, in his book veil the secret wars of the cia 1981 to 87 he claims that um, in 1976 so this is around the time that mark was there mark david chapman was there the cia was maintaining a large presence in beirut um that, that's, that's what was going on there that's miles copeland was based in beirut as well who's the father of stuart copeland from the police and all three that's of his right. sons were born in beirut and they all went on to have oh. roles in the music industry so yeah uh, copeland was a, a legendary cia operative working out of beirut indeed oh. Good cool and 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 finally with with, with regards to this uh, in the book john lennon lifetimes and assassination by phil strongman uh, i found another uh, a reference to the to Beirut and the CIA. It says uh, Beirut was a major base for CIA and U.S. naval intelligence right up until the 1980s. Uh, Beirut was also for years uh, said to have been home to one of the CIA's uh, top secret assassination training camps. Oh uh, boy! So that's according to uh, Phil Strongman. Um, and yeah, he was only there for a week, and then uh, a civil war broke out, so he had to come back um and yeah and then he came back and then he got involved uh, with vietnamese refugees and uh, i think this is where the um this is where the world vision um link uh, comes in um i'm just looking at my notes here boy if this was tv and you saw the amount of notes i've had to prepare for this, it's, absolutely, it's a huge subject absolutely it really huge. Yeah, it's but, a yeah, mess yeah. um oh, so wow. with world with World Vision, he worked with David Moore. David Moore was like his. I think he was yeah. kind of like a, like a gopher for David Moore, um, and um, or like a like a personal assistant type thing. It, it's not exactly clear, but um, but David Moore was the one around and with um, Mark David Chapman. They they met high ranking government officials. I think they even met um, Gerald Ford at one point. Um, and, and he shook so his was hands, through, didn't he? Right. Yes, exactly. And Ford, of course, was also um, attempted, uh, had an attempted assassination as well um, by uh, Squeaky From from the uh, the Manson family. So that's kind of an interesting <laughs> little segue there. We don't have to get into that. But um, but through David Moore and World Vision, it seems like that somehow that's how um, they got their um, the the money for all that traveling. They seem to travel together. Is kind of what I'm gathering from that. 
Um, and so David Moore was a was a, a some kind of a ranking official within the the World Vision um, team there. But again, it, it's so difficult to really find anything any of anything of substance. And it seems like you go from one article to another to another, and they all have different yeah. information. So it's really yeah. difficult to discern what is accurate and what is not in a lot in a lot of these uh, different ins and outs. Yeah, but I mean, with regards to the world vision thing, I mean, uh, Desiree, I don't know if you found this, and Mark, but you look on blogs that that concentrate on the uh, the Lenin uh, assassination, and they they mention Mark David Chapman, and then they mention World Vision, and that's mm -hmm. where it stops. You don't actually get any kind of confirmation of where this comes from. I have actually been haven't been able all the books and all the magazines and all the articles that I've looked at and, and owned and read and. I can't. I get the names. I see the names linked together on a page. Mm -hmm. Mark David Chapman, World Vision, da da da. But I don't actually get any source links to verify either whether Mark David Chapman is linked to World Vision CIA or whether World Vision is linked to CIA. And I've had to do my own detective work, especially for this podcast, to be to be able to to identify whether there are any actual links at all. And there are. There are links. Um, Matt, what does there Mark... are, but they they either seem to not be available to for like you know us, the average Joe, um, or scrubbed or just not talked about because you're right, it just it just stops and there hasn't been like a like a detailed biography of Mark David Chapman or anything like that that we can kind of you know look at either because you know nobody wants to make him famous. So what does Mark Lewis really said about this, Matt? Oh, well, he hasn't got that far yet, has he? We oh, could right. wait another 20 years for that. He's still stuck in the 60s, is he? <laughs> yeah. Who's this? Uh, yeah, 1962. Mark Lewison, the biographer. Oh. <laughs> but what I've, I've discovered, and I, I'm not saying that this makes it all true and that Mark David Chapman was Intel assassinator just because I found this particular information. It's up to the listener what, I'm, what I can tell you now, what I'm about to tell you if you want to hear it, whether, you know, it's up to the listener to judge whether it all links together nicely or not. But what I've been able to... Uh, find with regards to World Vision, CIA, and Mark David Chapman is basically Mark Chapman um, in the 1970s, and this would have been after the YMCA Beirut thing. He he, um, in conjunction with the YMCA, he went to work at a refugee settlement camp uh, at Fort Chaffee. Is that how you pronounce mm -hmm. it? Fort mm -hmm. Chaffee yep. in, in Arkansas. Chaffee. Um, and this was um, after the end of the Vietnam War, and he was dealing with Vietnamese. Uh, refugees, a resettlement camp for that. So again, it was this kind of, he's working in a camp uh, counselling kind of sort of uh, environment. And he was just, so the official story goes, what he was doing there was basically he was helping to, helping the refugees to, to you know, climatise, acclimatise to a, a new environment, as it were. Um, he was providing physical and leisure activities for them, uh, for the thousands of refugees uh, that were, were that would get were, that were going there. Um, so the thing with World Vision is, um, and again, this is according to authors, researchers that have pieced this together and that I've been able to to find. Um, it would appear that, according to the research that I've been able uh, that I've discovered that the CIA and World Vision were working together um, uh, uh, not only with with regards to the Vietnam War but also with Cuba. Uh, I've got a source, I've got a, an article here that states World Vision had a hand in the movement of the Cubans into the United States and other refugees of uh, revolutionary regimes. World Vision uh, was able to recruit out of these mercenary populations people who could be politically tuned and turned to their intelligence purposes. World Vision served as a covert penetration force for the CIA, not as visible as the military actually going in. So they were going in as missionaries and working among the people. And uh, with uh, so, and that's um, taken from the book Spiritual Warfare uh, by uh, uh, Sarah Diamond. Mm. Or is that Sarah Diamond? I don't know. Uh, but uh, I've also found uh, another quote and i'm just flipping through the pages here um 
yeah, in tandem with its food distribution and leadership training for indigenous believers, World Vision has on a number of occasions functioned as an intelligence gathering arm of the US government mm -hmm. in the 1970s. Uh, in the 70s, World Vision was, was charged with having collected field data for the CIA in Vietnam after US troops left the region. World Vision played a major role in the administration of refugee camps. And again, if I'm not mistaken, that's also taken from the same book uh, by Sarah Diamond. So, you know, and this would have been around the same time period that uh, World Vision and the CIA would have been up to no good with the refugee camps with regards to Vietnam. And of course, around the same time that Mark David Chapman, of course, uh, would have been uh, involved with refugee camps. Whether Fort Chaffee in Arkansas was one of those, I don't know. Hmm. I don't know. It, 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 it's and it seems seemingly impossible to find that information to know if they're linked or not. But it seems that they are. But um, as far and, as and you can also link World Hinkley Vision. to this. Hinkley uh, links to this because uh, John Hinkley's father. Uh, John W. Hinckley Sr., who's also known as Jack Hinckley. I think he was a wealthy businessman. He was he dealt in oil and the gas business. And he was also friendly with the, the, the family were friendly with the Bushes. I mean, that's the other thing we haven't mm -hmm. mentioned is that um, on the day that Reagan was shot, uh, the vice president, George H.W. Bush, his son, Neil, and this, this, was, this was according to mainstream reports at the time, Neil is claimed to have been all set to host a dinner party at his house with a member of the Hinckley family as his guest. And then it was cancelled after the shooting. So, but yeah, I right. mean, if you dig deep, you'll find that uh, actually the Hinckley family, parts of the Hinckley family were uh, uh, financing um, uh, George H.W. Bush's bid to become the vice president. It's the same with uh, the Bin before. Ladens one generation later, wasn't it? I They're know, right? it just never mm -hmm. stops with that family, does it? It and just yet, doesn't. They have their fingers in everything, it seems. <laughs> and they have their fingers in world vision. They have their fingers in world vision because uh, John Hinckley's father, Jack uh, Hinckley, uh, as I say, he was a wealthy businessman uh, in the oil and gas business. So that's how he would have known the Bushes because they were in, right. in oil and gas and, and energy and everything. Um, he also became an active member of World Vision, which uh, apparently, in case anyone doesn't know, it's like a, a California-based Christian-flavoured relief and development agency. So it's another kind of YMCA, in a way, if you like. But they can get into different countries under the guise of so-called, quote-unquote, relief humanitarian aid. They can go to various countries and provide that. So the claim is, is that the CIA use them, as I said, they use them in order to do that. But yeah, um, you know, they, the CIA use them in order to, 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 to do out their deeds for them uh, covertly. <laughs> um, but yeah, apparently uh, Hinckley was um, uh, not, uh, not only a donor of uh, World Vision, but he was actually a president of the board of <laughs> World Vision. So, you know, you can collate all this stuff together and and you know and and and, and talking yeah, about the cia as we have uh, a lot up to now we should throw jose podomo into the mix uh, we do yes, need I to was... cover him because he's said to have been a cia assassin and he just happens to crop up as the doorman on the dakota on the night that john lennon was shot and there is a school of thought that he may have actually been the assassin rather than chapman but uh, I, I think you may feel that's a bit of a false lead there, don't you, Desiree? Well, I, I'm not sure that that has been proposed. Um, I don't know that he might have been another assailant, but there is some um, there is some eerie and strange coincidences talking just about uh, World Vision just now and how um, Matt said that, you know, they were um, in with the refugee camps from uh, Cuba well, that's actually where um, Padormo is said to have come from. He was in a um, one of those Cuban refugee camps. That's how he came to the United States in the first place. And um, after a while, became kind of like a leader or like a, a trainer of sorts, kind of like Mark David Chapman has been said to have uh, been as well. And he was supposedly a part of Operation 40. Uh, this is Padormo now. Um, that was... Uh, you know, commissioned to uh, try to um, assassinate Fidel Castro in the 60s. And um, uh, there's just some interesting um, correlations with that. And then somehow, you know, in 1980, you know, 15 years later, he's the doorman um, 
at the Dakota building and is one of only, I think there's a total of four witnesses of what exactly happened that night. One being John Lennon himself, one being Yoko, one being Mark David Chapman and the other being Jose Padormo. So it's, it's, it's interesting. Like why a a former, um, you know, CIA informant or assassin or whatnot, you know, why exactly would he be there? Could be a complete coincidence. He retired and this was just something he could do and enjoyed doing and that's fine. But it's just, it's just odd how all of these strange little coincidences and alignments line up and then it kind of just leaves you scratching your head like, well, that seems to be kind of perfect, you know, odd that it all works out this way. So, um, an Operation yeah. 40 is said to have been involved in the Kennedy assassination, as was George W. Bush, uh, H.W. Bush. Right. So we're back to him again. These things just keep circling round and round. And Padoma was part of that team, supposedly. But he's the guy that ran up to Chapman, or is said to have done, uh, and said, my God, do you know what you've done? And Chapman is said to have responded, I've just shot John Lennon, right? Correct. Uh huh. And um, supposedly, the, according to which uh, story you go by, um, Padormo either took the gun out of Chapman's hand at the time, or Chapman dropped the gun, and Jose Padormo kind of kicked it away. And at this time, at by that time, we had other people on the scene, and um, the one of the other Dakota employees grabbed the gun, took the gun, and took it off of the scene, down into the basement of the Dakota. And um, and waited for the police drive, which came in like two minutes. The police were on scene with within two or three minutes of all of this happening. So I'm sure it was a very big, you know, cluster F of a scene. <laughs> but um, and it happened in, in rapid succession. But yes, um, Jose Prozormo is really the only non either. Um, uh, suspect or victim um uh, on the scene that saw literally everything and um and after that he just, just happened, kind of s- to be CIA. slinked off and faded into the background didn't he there's very little heard of him after that right he did continue to work there for years and years oh right okay. so yeah he, he continued to work as the doorman for quite a few years after that oh, right. okay. not he's not there anymore but at least i think um eight or ten years after he was still there hmm. so just very interesting There's some inconsistencies in the accounts of how Lennon was shot as well. He's said to have been shot from behind by Chapman with the bullets coming out through, you know, his chest, the exit wounds. And yet there were some inconsistencies with some of the medical reports, I think, there, which were Mm -hmm. claiming that he was shot from the front with the exit wounds coming from the rear. So there's discrepancies even with, you know, that aspect of it. Oh, absolutely. There's a ton of discrepancies. So again, um, depending on the account that you take into account and believe, um, there's lots a host of different interpretations going on. But I think what what's really important, I think, to remember uh, when we're talking about this is there was literally no real investigation as to what happened because they arrested the their suspect on site. He pled guilty. There was no no real investigation. So all of this is just kind of speculation and um, in one way or another. And, you know, that that evening, we already had uh, the evening in question, we already had um, media outlets reporting on exactly what happened. And so it was like that, those initial media reports are still exactly the same media reports that we get now. They haven't ever changed. Nobody was on site to see. There was no witnesses. Nobody was interviewed. So it's kind of just almost seems like it was like hearsay passed to one to the next. And um, and with that, we have a lot of different, it's kind of like the telephone game. You know, it starts out with one thing. You say something to somebody else, it gets slightly changed. And then they get said something else and it gets slightly changed. And so there's a lot of different versions of what exactly happened. But as far as we know, from what was recovered on site, um, the uh, gun that, that Chapman used was a um, 38 Special, which is a five-shooter gun, and he used hollow-tip bullets. So we have the actual bullets that were used, so we we're pretty sure that that's true, and we have the gun that was used, so we're pretty sure that that's true, even though it was removed from the crime scene and then brought back later. But that's a different that's a different topic. 
So the the coroner or the medical examiner rather um, had said that he believed from the way that the wounds were placed that he was shot at point blank range. So right up on him, it was, he said his words, a good shot group which means it, was, it wasn't just random. It was like successive right at one after another. And with a like a Magnum revolver, which is like a much larger sized revolver. So right there you have a discrepancy. But su- supposedly Mark David Chapman shot five shots, all five of his bullets. He used hollow tip bullets, which are supposed to, and I'm not a ballistics e- expert by any means at all, but this is just from what I've read and from how I understand it. Hollow tip bullets are meant to, as soon as they hit their target, they like mushroom out. And so they, they're they meant to stick inside whatever they hit so that um, they're not supposed to produce exit wounds at all. That's the entire point of having hollow tip bullets. And so somehow he managed to get off, get out five shots, four of them hitting John. Three of those bullets produced exit wounds. And his, the bullets were found in his jacket. Um, one remained lodged inside of John. And then um, one went over his head and hit a glass pane window, which, an, again, is another strange thing because that was the window that they hit was on the far right side of the Dakota building. And Mark David Chapman was standing. I mean, it would, the bullets would have had a turn, made a hard right turn to make produce bullet holes in this glass. But uh, anyhow, so so we have the three bullets that were recovered in uh, Lennon's jacket that evening, one that would remain lodged in him, and then there's three bullet holes in the pane glass lobby window. So to me, that seems like that's way more than five bullets. If you count them up, so you have three in his jacket, okay, one that remains in him, that's four. And then three holes in the glass. And there's a, if you go to my blog, I have a, um, an article on there, uh, the way things are going. And there's a, a big picture that they took. And very clear, there's absolutely three um, bullet holes in that glass. So it's kind of difficult to argue that only five shots were shot, no matter how you look at it. And that, that right there, just that one point is... Like the obvious to me that something else happened than what we have been led to believe this entire time because that the math just doesn't add up there. And so few so, journalists or investigators seem to have looked into this in forty years. Here we they, are talking that, about it now. I've but... never, yes, I've never once heard that question. You know, and it's it's like that's just so strange to me. You know, they talk about the JFK assassination all the time and the the magic bullets and all of that stuff and all of that stuff's talked about. But the, this particular case with John Lennon is like, it's hushed. Like nobody talks about it. And it's the strangest thing to me because there's so many glaring discrepancies about everything. It's like you so, say, there's an official narrative that's decided upon and it's just trotted right. out decade after decade. The, the thing is, even the official narrative goes a bit wonky. I mean, I've looked into the shooting, you know, the actual nuts and bolts of it, if you like, what happened on the night or what said to have happened on the night. And you and, and I've, I've I've got all the bits of paper here from the various websites and news sources. And I've printed all the all the sources up onto bits of paper. and I've got them all strewn across here in front of me. And you've got different differing reports. I mean, for example, uh, June 22nd, 1981. And I've got part of the transcript here from the competent, uh, competency hearing that uh, Mark David Chapman took. Uh, basically, I think this is one of the hearings where they were trying to find out if he was going to plead guilty or not guilty. I'm not sure if it was this particular hearing, but it was one of these kind of uh, hearings where they're, 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 they're checking uh, Mark David Chapman's statement. Um, he's standing in court and he's giving them his version of accounts. And the judge says to him, how many times did you shoot the gun? And he said, five shots. Uh, and how many times did you strike the victi- victim? And Chapman says four. Right, fair enough. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, but then in an interview with Larry King in 1999, I think this was, one of the very few interviews 
that uh, Mark David Chapman has ever done, one of the very few media interviews he's ever given. And again, just to point out, if he wanted to be famous, how come is it he's only done about five or six media interviews in 40 years? Right. Anyway. And the um, first one was like 20 years later. Yes, yeah, something like, you know, or, yeah. or, I think it was seven, eight years afterwards for a magazine article, oh. I think. Oh, right. Okay. At ID Mobile, we don't waste our money on celebrity voiceovers. Why not? I'm a great, great guy. Noom, Aero, Uno. It's proven by science. Instead, we put our money into giving customers great service, better prices, and fantastic Christmas offers. Like a gift card worth up to £100 on selected handset and SIM-only plans. That's a great deal. Really great deal. That's why ID Mobile is a which recommended mobile provider. Switch and save today at idmobile.co.uk. Okay. Uh, I mm -hmm. think so. I'm not sure. But uh, this one with Larry King was 1999. And in that, he says he fired uh, five shots. Okay. Five shots, not four, five shots into his back. Uh, and there's also uh, witness statements that were taken on the day and various other statements that were taken literally minutes and hours after, after the, the incident occurred. Uh, I've got a news report, a UPI and AP news report here. Um, uh, and this this um, was I'm, I'm assuming given I'm reading it here and assuming by the style that it's written that this is literally minutes, maybe an hour after or a couple of hours after it happened. And uh, a spokesman says here that Lennon was shot three times. OK, so we got three times there. Um, just turning the pages here on all these bits of paper I've got. And then we've got a, 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 a witness by the name of Sean Strube. Mm. Now, he's one of the few witnesses that was there at the time, or so we're told was there. Uh, he didn't actually see anything. OK, he didn't actually see anything. He said he says that by the time he got to actually see anything, it was when John Lennon was being taken into the back of the police car mm. to be taken to the hospital, to be taken to Roosevelt Hospital, because apparently the police thought that John Lennon was in such a bad way that they couldn't wait. So they thought the best thing was to just get him into the back of the police car, not wait for the ambulance to, to arrive and just get him straight to the hospital, get him in. the. So that's what he saw. He saw Lennon going into the back of the car. Now he says that, um, and again, I'm quoting here, this is his quote. He says, some people told of hearing six shots. Mm -hmm. So we've got six shots there. And then there's an unidentified female witness uh, who spoke to uh, a TV reporter, Channel 7 Eyewitness News. So again, this is just maybe presumably, you know, minutes, hours, you know, after the, the event occurred. And um, she didn't actually see much either. But what she says is, all of a sudden, I heard five or six shots. So again, <laughs> it's this six shots, five shots, you know, yeah. three shots. Um you know, I don't know what's going on there. I mean, the, the, the thing is, is that if, you know, you know, uh, uh, you know, if, if, forgive me if I've got this wrong, you'll correct me if I'm wrong, guys. But from what I understand, um, John Lennon was hit in the left. Uh, all the bullets hit the left, the shoulder. Um, and Mark David Chapman was said to have been standing on the right. OK, mm -hmm. isn't that right? Yeah, he was standing on the right. Yep. In fact, there is a diagram and it's on I think it's on your website, Desiree, isn't it? On one of your articles. You've it got, is. Uh -huh. You've got a, a, a an article or a, a, a diagram that was actually in the New York Times in an article in a news report the day after the shooting. Mm -hmm. And it's a diagram of how the shooting occurred. So you've got the limo where uh, John Lennon came out of at the sidewalk. And then it's mm -hmm. got this kind of um diagram that shows the direction he he walked in right. and it's got chapman to on the right and him shooting and hitting lennon from the, in his back in mm -hmm. the left it's those kennedy magic bullets again inside right body. so chapman's on the yeah. right exactly is that possible is that possible can you can you do that is that possible to i'm not I, like you say des right i'm not an expert in, with trajectories and so on but can you stand on the right and shoot and hit someone in the left in their back? Can you do that in their shoulder area? Is that possible? You no, know, I, I, it's probably possible. Like I said, it would, it would be. I would think it would be very difficult. It, it almost seems like he would be like a professional, being able to make those kinds of a shot. You know, not just some amateur that was, you know, doing this for for fame, but. Um, but yeah, so he, so John and Yoko passed Chapman 
on the on his left. So Chapman was standing on the very right hand side of that doorway. John and Yoko go by him on the left. And supposedly, as soon as John passes, he Chapman got into his combat position and fired. Some say he says Mr. Lennon to where John started to turn around. Yeah. And um others said that didn't actually happen, but again. There's I've only a couple witnesses, Chapman's... who knows? Yeah, I know. I mean, this is the weird thing. Where are all these statements actually coming from? Because right. from what I can gather, Chapman never said he went into a combat stance. This is something that came out in various articles and books and what have you. But from what right. I understand from having looked at what Mark David Chapman has said about all of this, from what he says took place, he never went into a combat stance. And he didn't say, because uh, hey. there is this narrative that he, as soon as John Lennon walked past him, he said, Mr. Lennon. And right. John Lennon looked at him, turned round and looked at him. Right. Mark David Chapman has never said that happened. He just said he shot in his shot his back. What do we know right. about Yoko's him? behaviors? What's Yoko said about all this? Because she was a witness. Uh, not much uh, from what I can understand. Not a whole lot, no? Right. No, so, lot, so, Yoko, so, so Yoko was in front. Yoko walked out of the limo first and she was about 20 steps or so uh, in front of John. And so she was like kind of already in the, the safeguard of the building um, as this was happening. So she would have, I mean, at least if that's truly what happened, um, her back would have been completely turned to all she this. She would have heard the shots and then turned. She would have heard the shots, yeah, but not yeah. not seen what had happened, transpired but before the, the that. The thing is, if, if John Lennon had have turned, as one researcher I've noticed has picked up on, and good call on that research of picking it up, um, but if if it's true that and, and it, uh, if Mark, if it's true, who knows? But if, if it's true <laughs> that uh, that Mark David Chapman did say Mr. Lennon and John Lennon turned around, then how is it if he's standing on his right and John right. Lennon turns around? How could he have hit him in the back on the left? He couldn't have. He he, couldn't that's have. when he would have been in the chest, right? Because he would have right. turned and then he would have been hit in the chest rather than in the back. Right. So, yeah, very strange. Very strange. And, and then and you've, the, yeah, I was going to say you've got this um, uh, Dr. Halloran. Uh, I think oh. his name is Dr. David Halloran, who was the main doctor uh, at the emergency room at the Roosevelt Hospital when John Lennon was brought in and when they did the emergency resuscitation. And he has said, and this is on video, you got this, it's on YouTube, you can find it if you look for Dr. Halloran. He says, check this. He had four shots over the front of his chest, three exit wounds at the back. Mm -hmm. What? But I thought he was shot in the back. And William Joseph Gamble, okay, another name I've picked up. He was a New York, he's now, in, uh, he, he became a New York City detective. But he was one of the officers who responded on the night of the shooting. And he has said he was shot in the chest. John Lennon was shot in the chest. That was his uh, statement. So we can spot all these discrepancies right. 40 years later, but apparently nobody at the time could. Yeah. Right. Or right. nobody talks about it or, or, or something. Covering it up. Right. Or someone's exactly. covering it up. You know, there's, there must have been another shooter there, whether it was Podomo or not, because uh, you've got the um, the statement um, the, of, of Peter Cullen, uh, a guy by the name of Peter Cullen. He was a patrolman uh, for New York uh, 20th precinct and he i think he was the what the first or one of the first to to uh, uh to turn up on the scene uh, he mm -hmm. got the call and he turned up there and everything was pretty fresh when he turned up there so he turned up there with a gun in his hand ready for anything you know it was still fresh everything was still going on and apparently his first thought when he got there was that was that it was the handyman who was the shooter and it was only when the doorman said that it was Chapman, that Chapman was then approached. And according right. to Cullen, he couldn't believe it. It was like his instincts had been insulted because his police instincts was to look towards the handyman. Um, right. But he didn't. And he, 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 and and he, he also he, said that there were, there were um, three men there that he didn't recognize, too. And um, from all of the other accounts, there wouldn't have been three men that he didn't recognize there. So, I mean, there, and that's separate from Padormo, the, the doorman, because he said he saw Padormo there and um, Padormo had informed him that, yes, Mark David Chapman was the, the shooter and that he had just shot John Lennon. And yeah. so, and so, so again, he, he had it, said there were other people there, but who were all yeah, these other who people? Were all these 
the people, yeah. Um, and so again, you know, th this this brings us back to Podomo. I'm not 100% convinced that Podomo was the man. I think it, this might be one of those, those little red herrings that's been thrown in. I mean, we can go right. back to that if you want. As I say, this is a huge subject and there's so much to remember about what we should turn back to and talk about again. You know, we're, mm. we're going all over the place here. Uh, and there's so much to remember. But um, I mean, the thing about Podomo is if if why didn't Podomo, you know, he you know, the, the story is, is that he said Podomo said to Chapman after he shot Lennon, do you know what you just did? Right. And um, and they took the gun away from him. And I think it was the handyman, actually, um, um, the elevator operator. Sorry, I'm right. looking at my notes here. It's a, a, a guy by the name of Joseph Many. Um, mm -hmm. He was the Dakota elevator operator. He was asked by Podomo to take to because what Chapman did was he shot Lennon and then he dropped the gun and then he got Catcher in the Rye out of his pocket and started to read it. Uh -huh. right. Mind control. <laughs> but what happened was um, <laughs> Podomo said is said to have said to this uh, Joseph Many take the gun and just get rid of it. And as you say, Desiree, it was it was t taken down an elevator shaft or something and taken down mm -hmm. into the basement. First fact is. That's messing with police evidence. Who's to right. say that the gun that Don't was taken do down that. into the basement is the same gun that they gave to the police? Another right. thing is, seeing that Jose Padoma was a quote-unquote security guard, why didn't he apprehend Mark David Chapman? Knowing that the gun had been taken away from him, why didn't he try to stop? Uh, why didn't he try to at least apprehend him, get physical with him? Why didn't uh, he there, leave him there to read the book? There's some accounts that say Padormo turned to Chapman and said, go on, get out of here. Like, yeah. why are you still standing here? Like, go on. Like, you know, encouraging the suspect to leave the scene. Well, thank God you he know? was on security that night, eh? <laughs> <laughs> which then, <laughs> it's just so exactly, weird. Which then has some researchers questioning whether th that Padoma was his handler and he wanted Chapman to go to get out of there basically right. it, when, when he's supposed wasn't... to have said to chapman do you know what you've done some seem to think that podomo yeah. was his handler and he wants to check that chapman is going to give that story to the cops yeah. so when he says i've just shot john lennon he's right on script yeah he's thinking few you know podomo's thinking few oh all right yeah. we're, we're, we're on the, the right road here but you know i mean we're never going to really know what happened and, and if the, the trajectories and everything match up with uh, the wounds of John Lennon and, and so on and so forth, because um, apparently the full auto autopsy report, I mean, you can get the death certificate, if I'm not mistaken, you can find mm -hmm. that online, but you will not get the full autopsy report. And I know this because there's a, a, an author by the name of Salvador Astucia, who is the author of Rethinking Lennon's Assassination. And you can actually get this book online. You can read it online. And he tried to get the full autopsy report in 2003 2002 2003 and he was denied it and he was denied it uh by the um director of public affairs uh at the office of the chief medical examiner which is interesting because the chief medical examiner back in 1980 was uh, a man by the name of dr elliot m gross um you don't hear a lot about this guy, and I'm, I'm surprised that no one's really looked into him. So I, I've done a little bit of digging, okay? So this, this is the guy, effectively, who, if I'm not wrong, who would have been effectively the boss of all the coroners in New York back in 1980. This was his job back in 1980. Uh, he was this state examiner, uh, chief medical examiner. Now, in 1985, I've got a news story here with the headline that reads, Dr. Gross accused of incompetence by state agency at the state health department. It says here in this report, after a six month investigation uh, has lodged 12 charges of gross incompetence or negligence against uh, Dr. Elliot M. Gross at the city's chief medical examiner in New York. He was charged with professional misconduct. Uh, in the handling of a series of cases, including deaths of people in police custody. And then in 1987, a couple of years after that, the mayor at the time of New York sacked him. Uh, he fired uh, um, uh, this, this uh, Dr. Elliot M. Gross after allegations, and I'm quoting here from a, another news story, after allegations uh, that his office may have altered autopsies uh, to cover up police uh, misconduct. And again, reading from, from this article, one such example was the case of a Michael Stewart in 1983 who died after being arrested by police. According to the official report 
uh, he lost consciousness after he became violent and had to be subdued by officers. He was automatically sent to a nearby hospital and he died there 13 days later, never regaining consciousness. Uh, Gross ruled in his report of the death that Stuart had succumbed to a cardiac arrest leading to his death. However, a physician who witnessed the autopsy on behalf of Stuart's family concluded that he'd been strangled during his struggle with the police who arrested him. So, yeah. And then what happened uh, in 1990? Mm -hmm. So fast forward two, three years later, um, those charges were dropped uh, against Gross. He, uh, um, um, they actually dropped the, the, those, you know, those allegations against him. So he was, you know, kind of free of that. But uh, as uh, it was the New York Times uh, newspaper that um, initially caught on to Gross and 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 uh, exposed these these charges and allega uh, these allegations that then became, you know, charges. Mm -hmm. And according to a New York Times uh, article. When, when Gross was sacked from his job, he left, and this I'm quoting again here from another article, he left behind an office in a state of chaos. An official report stated that the medical examiner's office, Gross's office, was plagued by, and I quote, thefts of gold teeth from bodies, and that bodies were frequently left in hallways because of a lingering storage problem. The report mm. added other grisly details. For example, the morgue was forced to dispose of tons of accumulated body parts and blood oozing storage cabinets. There were bloody footprints of morgue workers leading from improperly stored specimens, areas Gross. infested with rats and cockroaches and body parts being sent for incineration in conventional black plastic bags. So Ugh, from Jimmy Savile would have been at home there, wouldn't he? Jeez. <laughs> He'd have loved to have worked there. If there is any way you need a face oh, mask. Horrible. You know what I mean? Um, so, yeah, he, he lost his job, he, he, his New York medical examiner's job. Yeah, and they dropped those charges, but it was too late by then. And he got a job. He got another job as a medical examiner uh, in New Jersey and also as a part-time assistant medical examiner for Atlantic uh, County. Um, and everything was going okay until... 1998, uh, and the case of Ellen Andros, who was a, the 31-year-old, 31-year-old wife of uh, a, a police officer, and what happened was um, she died, and she, it was it was said that, it, that her husband, uh, her cop husband, was was uh, arrested because it was claimed that he was drunk and he strangled her, and uh, Gross. Uh, put that down in his, uh, his his report. He put uh, that she died of strangulation. Um, but another uh, pathologist um, took a look at the body and he discovered that, no, she'd actually died of spontaneous coronary artery dissection, which is a rare condition. Rare condition, but as the, path the pathologist stated at the time, back in 1998 or 1999, whenever it happened, Yes, a rare condition, but Gross should have noticed it. So he got sacked again. He got sacked again oh. in 2002. Stuff, so, so that's the guy that was in charge of John Lennon's body at the time. There is something we should get into the conversation because there's probably people listening that will be screaming at us to cover it. And this is the idea that in some way... John's assassination didn't actually take place and was faked. So this has been put forward by Miles Mathis, who claims this kind of thing a lot. And there are some other researchers that seem to think that the whole thing was a hoax. It was a put up job and John never actually died. We, we should just address this, I guess. Any thoughts on this way of thinking? <sighs> I, I'll, I'll address it quickly. <laughs> I don't know how much weight I put into it, honestly. Um, I, but but it's an it's an interesting subject to to go over, I suppose. Um, but yeah, so the the theory put forth by a few people is that this was all fake and a cover up, and um, John Lennon is you know living happily in seclusion in Canada or somewhere else of his choosing, I suppose. And um, one of the more significant things for me with that theory is um, almost everybody who saw John that night from the police officers who put him into their squad car to um, the doctors that worked on him and the nurses that were there that evening. Um, none of them seemed to recognize this person as John Lennon. Mm. None of them seemed to realize that it was actually John Lennon until like his IDs were found in his clothes at the hospital, for example. And they're oh, 
wow, this is John Lennon, you know, kind of thing. <clears throat> and so I, I guess in that sense, that kind of does raise the case that, okay, possibly something more to this was going on. Um, but I, I don't know how, how much more <laughs> we should get into that or not. <laughs> It's crazy because there's a theory that Paul McCartney is really dead, but he's pretending to be alive. And right, John so Lennon's really alive, but he's pretending to be dead. Right, right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, yeah, I, I'll, I'll just echo you there, Desiree. Yeah, that was Dr. Halloran, uh, the doctor I mentioned earlier. Um, mm. He said when, when John Lennon, uh, quote unquote, John Lennon, <laughs> question mark uh, in brackets, mm -hmm. Uh, uh, was uh, when they were trying to resuscitate him yeah um, one of the nurses said hey that looks like John Lennon and Dr Halloran is quoted as saying no that's not John Lennon and as you say it's, it's only when they found his wallet and the ID and everything but um, but you know if if and there was a policeman as well um, right. um, William Joseph Gamble I think I mentioned him before um, he said and I quote he'd lost so much blood John Lennon had lost so much blood when he saw him that he was unrecognizable i mean you can take right. that in any way which way you want but um right. yeah i mean you could say with the wallet i mean if, if you if you support this idea that it wasn't john lennon you could say that the wallet had been planted on him sure i mean you know um you see i don't if, if it was I, all planned ahead of time they could have planned all of that you know what i mean it, it's yeah that's the thing you know, so it's, it's, it's a bit yeah it's a bit of an elaborate kind of fix there's also a theory easy. that chapman didn't really go to jail he did the odd interview that makes it appear like he's in jail but really you know he never did and he's just out there somewhere that's another extension to that yeah right i mean if no one's read the miles mathis um uh, article go take a look and, and see what you think i'm not convinced that he puts forward the the thesis or the theory if you like that, it, it, that, that the guy that is now going around as a so-called john lennon look-alike act an entertainer by the name of mark stacer is actually hey. john lennon but i've looked at the pictures of mark stacer this john lennon professional uh, look-alike act he does not look like john lennon to me Maybe it's just the way I perceive things, but he, to me, he does not look like he's passing himself off as the that he's actually the John Lennon, the real John Lennon. It, you know, Miles right. Mathis sees it like that, but I I can't see it myself. Um, the only other thing that I would say make, makes me wonder whether it was all faked is is the is the actual picture of John Lennon's dead body. Now, if anyone's got oh, to yes. see, if you look at the picture of John Lennon's dead body, it just does not look like doesn't look real it looks like it's been photoshopped or it's been it looks like it's wax it yeah looks like it's wax yeah the, the, the right. face part looks real like the nose and the eyes and the hair but when mm. it gets to the ears and the neck it kind of looked like it, it looks like it's a rubber mask that's not been fastened properly and it's like splayed out it's like you know what i mean like you right. say almost like a wax model and why have they got the black bag right up to his neck you can't see the body it just it doesn't look real that's you have very to go true. And see it. So, and especially yeah. with what you just came out with, with the medical examiner and all of his kind of shady things, you know, I, I, I've heard that he was purposely, his body was kind of purposely left in the hallway so that people could take pictures, you know, kind of thing, you know, instead yeah. of being respectful with it and, you know, closing up the body bag and putting him where he's supposed to be, you know, he was just kind of put off to the side there for a minute with his head revealed you know like stuff like, like who who would do that i mean i guess if you have a shady medical examiner and he's making you know ten thousand by letting somebody take a picture of that or whatever but you know at the same time it's like why why would anyone just leave him sitting out there you know in a body bag half exposed after he's been pronounced dead and it's just just weird just weird stuff so yeah who we've knows? got the fact that this took place in the Dakota building as well uh, and we've mentioned some of the really strange connections between the Dakota and Rosemary's Baby and Roman Polanski and Sharon mm -hmm. Tate and Manson those connections just go on forever so it's a very right. auspicious setting isn't it yes all things that we've already discussed on other episodes so indeed yeah that's definitely something I go back to I would like to um I think I feel like we kind of skipped over a couple of things that I'd really like to go back and kind of um refresh a little bit about first um first and foremost I think the the day of the actual um, shooting that took place, um, you know, as we had mentioned, there was only a couple of witnesses there. Um, but one thing that is 
never i think i i think i'm the only person that i've ever noticed to bring up this question well, I is i know the... what you're gonna say <laughs> yeah <laughs> you are you are I, definitely. and it's yeah. like so to me it is so obvious and blaring that I, I can't believe that nobody has ever discussed this before but um so i can't be the only one but anyhow john and yoko were coming back from the uh, recording that evening uh, at the record plant, which is uh, all the way across town, right? So they supposedly are coming back in their limo or a limo that was supplied to them from the record plant. Nobody's really sure. I can't ever, I can't find that information, but it does appear that they came back in a limo regardless. And the, the limo pulls up and lets them out on the street, which, first of all, is is very odd because he could have pulled up to the secure um, exit of the Dakota archway there and let them out there. They would have been completely secure and none of this might not have happened. Um, but anyhow, the limo driver pulls up right in front of that in that large entryway to the Dakota building and they get out and he's essentially blocking um, not only the view of what was about to happen, but um, from any other cars getting in or out of that um, of that driveway there. And so John, you know, Yoko gets out and John gets out and all of that happens. And apparently the limo is still parked there. So that would be another witness. First of all, whoever that driver was of that limo would be a witness. And second of all, the you know, the, the cops supposedly came two minutes after that and put John in the car in their squad car. Well, if, if, the, if it was such a, a, you know, a dire scene right there, they could have put John in that limo and taken him away. And there's no mention of where that limo went, you know, who the limo driver was. He could have been interviewed. He would have had the perfect, perfect eyewitness view of exactly what happened that evening. Because he had just literally dropped them off. And you also have to remember, the this whole entire scene was in a span of like 10 minutes. So it, Mark David Chapman supposedly started firing at like 10.54. And John Lennon was pronounced dead at the hospital at like 11.12. So we're talking 11, 12, 15 minutes total this entire thing happened in. So it, you know, just right in succession, it was almost like it was just put right into place. You know, shots fired, police on the scene, suspect arrested, Lennon's at the hospital, Lennon pronounced dead. They made the announcement on the the Monday um, night football game, which at 1130, I mean, that must have been a really long game for them to have announced it at Monday night football at 1130, 1145 at night, you know, so it's, it, it, this was all so fast and so rapid and they seemed to have all of the information and they knew exactly who did it and how many fired shots were fired and how he died and all of these things within minutes. It's just, it's just amazing. But that, that, that limo driver, I, I just don't understand how that has never that question has never been raised. He he was right, right, or he or she, I don't know, but right there in front of the scene, blocking the scene, had first, you know, a, a perfect view of exactly everything that happened. And, and not even maybe just that, since there was no investigation, but almost everybody else has made money off of this story, right? He's right. never given right. an account. He's never given an interview there we don't even know his name we don't even know if the lennon if the limo was the lennons or from the record plant or where it even came from yeah, so point. it's it's very 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 strange that um that that question has never been raised and nobody seems to know you know uh who that person was or where the limo went afterwards or where it came from in the first place so right. it's right. like the the mystery driver <laughs> yeah, exactly. And that's really good work there, Desiree, because you, I, I, I've never come across that. It was, it's, it's on your website, number nine blog. I've never seen the limo driver mentioned anywhere else. And, you know, so, yeah, uh, bizarre, isn't it? <laughs> you would have thought if someone wanted to cash in, you know, I was, you know, 
with the headline reading, I was there, I saw what happened, you'd think they'd want to cash in on it. But, you know, right. what's going on? Why, why, why the silence? Right. Um, I just want to tie up another loose end, and it's what I was talking about earlier with regards to Hawaii and the, and the suicide attempt, Mark David Chapman's suicide attempt. Um, so yeah, what, what was basically going, and this, this will kind of ex maybe explain where he was, where he got the money to go on this round the world trip that you were talking about, Desiree, basically what happened with the thing with Mark David Chapman was he, he, like I said earlier, he, 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 he was a bit of a coaster. He'd have one job, then he'd drop out, then he'd get another job, then he'd drop out and then he'd get another job. And he was doing this all across the U S and he was, mm. uh, um, and he was trying to get this, this university degree. Uh, so he could get the permanent job at the YMCA instead of just being a camp counsellor, that he could, instead of that, be a, a permanent employee. But it never happened. It, ne it just didn't work out. He kept dropping out of college and not following his studies properly. And uh, it just, life wasn't working out for him. So what he decided to do was to go to Hawaii and to start a new life in Hawaii. He thought, well, the, the, the mainstream version of events tells us that he thought to himself hey why don't i try hawaii you know nice weather you know tropical type scenery different scene maybe it'll lift me out of my bad spirits and i'll be able to get a job and so on and so on but um it didn't quite work out that way and he fell into this depression and this would have been around 1977 and as as we mentioned earlier he tried to he he he, he contemplated suicide and he, he he actually went ahead and tried to commit suicide so we're told and what he did was he he got a hose and attached it to his car exhaust and placed it inside the car and apparently what happened was the hose burned it melted and it was a, a failed attempt and he he, he hooked up with a but by, by this point he'd actually already hooked up with a psychiatric social worker he'd been assigned with a psychiatric social worker because before the suicide attempt he'd actually called a suicide hotline i think i mentioned this before but in between the suicide hotline and being assigned with this psychiatric worker as that was going on he also tried to commit suicide but his psychiatric social worker is actually she was interviewed and she's actually said that maybe he wasn't trying really to kill himself that it was kind of like attention seeking or a cry for help or something like that so but here's a weird thing okay and, and and you know think of mind control here okay now she has she has actually been interviewed and she has said that she she examined mark david chapman after this apparent suicide attempt and she was determined or she she determined she she concluded i should say that he wasn't psychotic, he wasn't mentally ill, but she thought, never mind that he isn't mentally ill. I'm going, to, she, she said, I, she, she actually admitted him into a psychiatric ward in hospital, even though he wasn't uh, mentally ill. She thought, what the hell, let's just, I'm, I'm going to admit him anyway, to, to check him over. Right. Now, if you're thinking mind control, maybe that's a little telltale sign there. So we, we, we've got here a potential mind control victim who's been placed in a mental institution. OK. And he stayed there for two weeks and then he was let out and he got a job there. <laughs> he was let out and he got a job there as the maintenance man and then as a, a junior member of the customer customer relations department. And it was at this time, I think it was 1978 a year later or a year or so later that he went on this round the world trip this very expensive round the world trip now according to mainstream events whether you want to believe this or not he got the money as a loan from the hospital the castle memorial hospital which is based in hawaii it, the, the, the hospital uh, actually gave him a loan to go <laughs> on this round the world trip okay fine but as some cynics have have asked yeah, okay, fair enough. But why would you lend so much money? Can you imagine how expensive how expensive it would have been? Because Desiree, you've you've decked out, you've 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 iron you've you've sketched out the actual places that he went to across the world earlier on. Can you right. imagine how expensive that would have been? Would uh, you're you're gonna lend money to a man who is a junior maintenance man, who is a junior member of the customer relations department? How is he gonna pay that back? Such right. a huge amount of money for a round the world trip. How is someone on his wage, on his salary, going to ever pay that back? And not just that, but he was a former patient there. Right. So he probably already owed 
them money for i mean if that's what happened right well, his yeah, medical yeah. bills and his okay, his yeah, and his stay there so how how why <laughs> makes no sense at all no sense always more questions than answers yes yeah, and was, yeah go on and to take i mean that you're so you're essentially asking for time off for vacation and not just time off and vacation but for them to pay for your entire vacation around the world like around the world <laughs> it's just so weird like who what, would do that what, delhi that israel um london uh was it holland uh wow i mean just they're not just like a few places like round the world literally right at id mobile we don't waste our money on celebrity voiceovers why not i'm a great great guy noom Aero, uno it's proven by science instead we put our money into giving customers great service better prices and fantastic christmas offers like a gift card worth up to 100 pounds on selected handset and sim only plans that's a great deal really great deal that's why id mobile is a which recommended mobile provider switch and save today at idmobile.co.uk right yeah you geneva know, but... london paris dublin tokyo and apparently when, he was, London, <laughs> when apparently when he was in london he was taking it west end shows and and you know he wasn't you know he oh was... and he had a bunch of, he had a lot of art i don't know if you read anything about that but he collected very expensive art um uh, like museum quality pieces like he had at salvador dali he had an actual yes. salvador dali uh, uh piece yeah how yeah. does one uh you know accumulate things like that again apparently according to the official version of events that was uh from uh uh he he borrowed some money off his mum who had just got divorced and it was her divorce settlement and she lent him the money to buy these loads of paintings i think one was a norman rockwell i think as well who's right. a painter and yes yeah, salvador dali uh, i'm looking here at the list i've got the list in front of me yeah just amazing all these lithographs and you know things that were thousands thousands right. of dollars you know and it it's funny because um a lot of the, when i was reading on this stuff a lot of these um art pieces that he collected to me and maybe it's just me and um but resonated a lot with the types of things that Yoko collected. Did you have you noticed that? And uh, and also it just his wife was of um, Japanese descent, yeah, like Yoko, and um, like it and the around the world trip. So John Lennon took a around the world trip that was kind of similar, just um, a year prior, or yeah, maybe it was a year and a half prior yeah. before to his death. He did a very similar trip to that, and um, at you know at the at Yoko had suggested that he do this, and um, it was yeah. And he signed his on his last day at work when he another job that he'd take. He'd left the the castle memorial. I, I think he'd had an argument with one of the staff, or there was a disagreement, and he got a job as a security guard in Hawaii. For it was, there you go, security guard, security yes. guard for, for some apartments. That's his last job before the, the shooting. Security guard for some apartments. Uh, and when he signed, so again, there's this correlation between the Dakota and security guards and Padermo, you know, security guard. Mm -hmm. um, so, and, and apparently he, when he signed his name out for, to, to, to leave work for the last day when he left, it was John Lennon. He signed out as, as John Lennon, right. um, which was noticed afterwards. Mm -hmm. But yeah, quickly, I just want to say that I've got some reservations about the Padermo thing um um so I, I don't i don't remember actually what we mentioned about Padermo, but i think it was basically the fact that jose Padermo is said to have been involved in the bay of pigs um um project which was a cia u.s government back project to kind of try and overthrow castro jose mm -hmm. Padermo is said to have been uh, anti-castro cuban exile who was then taken in by the cia to do this now according to um to frank sturgis um who was a cia agent and he was jailed for the watergate uh, burglaries when when the, the president nixon linked burglaries of the democratic building in 1972 i think it was uh, or maybe earlier, earlier than that when they they, they uh, a team of nixon's men um burglarized 
um, the, the the offices of, of the Watergate building where the Democrats were based, where they had offices and they wiretapped and bugged it and burglarized it and so on. So he was jailed for that. Frank Sturgis was a CIA agent and he was jailed for the Watergate burglaries. Now, he apparently knew a Jose Padermo um, and he claimed, Frank Sturgis claimed that uh, the, the, the Jose Padermo that he knew died of natural causes in uh, 1974 mm -hmm. uh, and he was going also uh, by the uh, alias of Joaquin Sangenis and apologies to anyone of, a, of Cuban extraction for murdering that pronunciation there but um, <laughs> yeah I mean th this is according to Frank Sturgis uh, do you believe a CIA agent for a start I mean would you believe his claims but th this hasn't been corroborated by anyone else this is according to Frank Sturgis back in the day that this is what, what happened to Jose Padermo, a.k.a. Uh, Joaquin Sangenis, that he died in 1974. Um, just to muddy the waters a bit more. Just to muddy right. the waters a bit more. And then uh, it could be that he died, but then again, it could be that he took on an alias um, because apparently there, there there is a Jose Padermo that goes, but the thing is, right, and I'm sorry I'm going off, but it's really confusing to me, right? The, the thing is, is that Jose Padermo had not been named by the media with regards to the Lenin assassination until 1987. So we're talking seven mm. years, right? For seven years, his name was not mentioned. It was always mentioned. It was always whenever the doorman was mentioned with regards to the shooting in the mainstream media, it was always it was always as the doorman or the security mm. guard. It was only in an article in 1987. <laughs> Uh, by James Gaines, and it was a, 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 a Chapman-backed um, article. It was for People magazine, and you can find this online, actually. I don't remember the title of the article, but you can find it online. And it, th this is the first time it was actually named Jose Padermo, quote-unquote, the doorman at the Dakota that night. And it also mentions, because what Chapman was doing before he shot Lennon, he was hanging around outside the Dakota because... Uh, there were a lot of fans always standing outside the Dakota waiting for John Lennon. This was like one of those regular things that well, was Matt, going on. I, want, I wanted to ask you just as a loose end, there's this famous photo of Lennon signing Chapman's copy of Catcher in the Rye. Uh, it's all mm. over the internet. Who is supposed to have taken that photo? A man by the name of Paul Goresh. That's it. And yeah. he, he just passed away a couple of years ago. Yeah. Um, but He, he was another uh, yeah. fan that was just hanging out there, is he? Yeah. He was another fan. He actually got kind of he got fairly That's close true. to um, John and Yoko over the years, but, um, but only after this double fantasy came back out. Before that, he was kind of, I think John had yelled at him a couple times because he kept trying to take his picture, like would wait for him to come out and and take their picture and and all those kinds of things. And I think he like swindled his way into the Dakota one time, saying he was a TV repairman or something like that, and um, ended up, you know. They found out that he wasn't a TV repairman and was kicked out and and all this stuff. But yeah, that that's who was supposedly took the picture of um, Mark David Chapman hmm, and okay. John Lennon that night. Hmm. You, you, do, you do wonder if you want because he was taking lots of because, as you say, he was hanging around outside the Dakota a lot. Mm -hmm. um, he was one of those fans that was always standing outside. It's, it's isn't it? Don't you think it's a bit strange that he never took more photos of Mark Chapman or indeed Jose Padermo? Right. Right. Because he's taking pictures. Apparently what, what Goresh was doing, he was taking pictures of John Lennon as he was coming in and out of the Dakota to go to various engagements, getting a right. limo or going to the store to buy something. And he would. T so he would take pictures of Lennon on the street. I think it's on the cover of the seven inch single, Watching the Wheels. It That's is. Like That's Goresh. his picture. That's mm -hmm. his picture. John and Yoko walking out of the Dakota. So how come that we don't see any of all the photos that he took of John and he took many, many, many candid photographs. How come we don't see any of him, of Mark Chapman hanging around outside, apart from this one where John signs uh, uh, jo uh, the double fantasy album that Mark David Chapman has bought. How come we don't see any pictures of, of any of the other staff? You know, for example, Jose Padermo. Um, right. You know, the thing is with Jose Padermo is so... You know, we, we we don't. This is why I'm a bit suspicious, right? We don't hear his name until 1987 in this article, and in this article, it explains the way his name is explained. It's explained that Mark David Chapman, on one of the many occasions that he was turning up outside the Dakota, waiting for John to come out so he could 
shoot him. Um, he got into this is how the article explains it. He got into a, a conversation with the doorman, whose name is Jose Padermo. And Jose talks about the Bay of Pigs and the JFK assassination. <laughs> now, it doesn't say that he's That's involved. convenient. That's convenient. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> It doesn't right. say that he was involved in it. It just says they just sat, they just stood there and just began to talk about this stuff, you know, just off the cuff. And it just got me a little bit uh, uh, suspicious. And then, um, and, th and then you realise if you know how many Jose Podomos are there out there? Maybe the guy, you know, I'm, I'm suspicious, but I will concede that maybe the Jose Podomo that they say is, you know. Maybe it is Jose Padermo, right? We're talking about the security guard outside the Dakota. Okay, but how many Jose Padermos are there in the world? Is right. this the Co is this Jose Padermo regular guy, or is this Jose Padermo CIA agent? Jose Padermo was definitely working there that night. A, a, a man named Jose Padermo, yeah. because he is mentioned the the. Um, the police officers mentioned that, you know, their statements that they give, they they mentioned specifically Jose Padormo, the doorman. So we know a man named Jose Padormo was working as the doorman that evening. But whether that that man is linked to the Jose Padormo of the CIA and the Bay of Pigs and all of that, that's kind of where the question Exactly. Is rates, right? Well, well, yes. Guys, right. we just hit the, the two hour mark now, so we should probably uh, wrap it up there, I guess. I don't think we're going to find the answer to that question anyway. We're just going to oh, puzzle over it and uh, be none the wiser. But we've had a great conversation. I think this time next year, we're going to be finding ourselves marking the 20th anniversary of George Harrison's passing and going yeah. back over all of that, uh, which we have covered on previous shows. But uh, yeah, I think we've done pretty well here in revisiting the Lennon event 40 years later. Hopefully we've done it justice. Do you just want to wrap up by reminding people about your blogs and uh, are there any new articles forthcoming that uh, people should look out for? Oh, I'll go ahead and, and yeah, go take that this, one right. first. Um, so yeah, I have the number nine uh, blog and um, not too much new coming out. Honestly, I'm putting together a full um, kind of John Lennon tribute that I plan to um, hopefully post this um, uh, broad or podcast on as well. Um, not too much new. I, um, I, I love John Lennon. I know that there's a lot of, you know, strange things about and, and all that, but, but I, I do have great respect for him and I do that all of this for me at least comes out of a place of respect. I really feel that if something is not quite right by what we've been led to believe about um, his murder or, or lack of murder, um, depending on what version of events you go with. Um, I, I do feel that, you know, it's, it's, it's out of respect that we should really have an investigation and figure out what the real, what really happened that day, you know? And um, I, I feel, I feel horrible. I can't believe that he's been now officially been dead as long as he was alive. You know, he was 40 years old when he was killed. This is his 40th anniversary. So that's a, a very long span of time mm -hmm. that, you know, nobody really seems to, um, question much about there's kind of accept and it's a very tragic and sad story but um i do hope that someday some of these questions these nagging lingering questions will be answered once and for all and maybe we have to wait a little longer until certain people have passed or something but i do hope that one day it all comes out so sure i, I appreciate all of your your work and dedication on this you guys i think it was a great show so thank you lovely Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, great. So, Matt, um, what you got going yeah. on? Oh, loads. Uh, um, oh, wow. Loads of articles to come, both on my site, Conspiro Media, and also on the Occult Beatles. Um, uh, just so many, so many different things. I won't go into them now. Um, but so, yeah, check, check those sites out. You've got Conspiro Media, which in recent years, it started in 2011, 2012, sometime around then. But uh in more recent years, in the last two, three years or so, it's been taking a look at the 1960s countercultural scene of London and of Britain. So it's kind of like uh, partly inspired by Dave McGowan's work with with Laurel Canyon and what he discovered, 
with regards to the US and Laurel Canyon, I, I thought I'd take a look. I'm taking a look at the the London scene uh, and London, which is made, you know sort of so sort of mostly where where the countercultural scene was was being sort of engineered, <laughs> oh, a good word that engineered, and um, where it was where it was happening. So so uh, you know go take a look at that site. Uh, there's not a lot of regular articles on that site at the moment because I've been doing years and years of research, background research into that. But um, you know so but do check it out. Uh, th th that's what that site is now dedicated towards. It never used to be. It used to be more of a topical thing about music, the music scene of the current music scene, if you like, but uh, I've, I've turned my attention towards the 60s. So that's what Conspiro Media is all about. And then you've got my site, The Cult Beatles, and then there's Conspiro Media at Facebook. And if you go there, you get a mixture of the two sites uh, and more stuff that you don't get on either site. So yeah, check, check those out. Yeah. And thanks, guys. Yeah, lovely. All right, thanks. great. And we'll see everyone for Magical Mystery Talk Episode 5 at some point in 2021. Cheers for now. Thank you.